Hello everyone and welcome to the People's Cells Dispatch. Uh, today we are here with Zane Rizvi from Public Citizen uh, to discuss uh, a new development in, uh, in the story about COVID-19 vaccines uh, and which is connected to Moderna's proceedings uh, against Pfizer uh, uh, because of uh, the uh, use of mRNA technology. So uh, welcome Zane. Maybe we can start with discussing uh, how this new court case by Moderna against Pfizer uh, has once again brought the issue of patents uh, for mRNA technology at the center of the debate, uh, which deals with COVID-19 medical pro products and, of course, other medical products as well. So uh, can you tell me a bit more why this is so? Uh, and what is actually Moderna playing in the court? So what, what are they trying to do here? Sure. So the story of mRNA technology goes back decades, right? There's science is always incremental. It builds on each other. Knowledge builds on each other. Um, and so, you know, there are many contributions that many people around the world have made to mRNA. Um, you know, perhaps one of the biggest breakthroughs came uh, in the late 2000s, when some academic researchers uh, at the U University of Pennsylvania discovered that if you just put mRNA into the body uh, itself, it's 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 uh, creates too many uh, side effects. You know, it, it's 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 almost uh, the body recognizes it as a foreign substance, and so it reacts to it. It's uh, reactogenic, and those scientists identified that if you substituted one piece of the RNA uh, with another piece of the RNA, uh, one of the, the, the bases, uh, then the body, if you modify the RNA as it's called, then uh, the body does not you know, have that same kind of negative response. And so that was a critical breakthrough, right? That opened up the kind of field of modified RNA. Um, and so the story of Moderna as a company actually is building off that discovery, right? Building off that invention rather. Um, they kind of, you know, the company's name Moderna comes from modified RNA, mod RNA, Moderna. Um, and so this is a company that should be understood as benefiting from this kind of, you know, foundational academic public science um, and also, of course, it has received kind of federal funding, uh, you know, at many stages of its development. So you look at mRNA technology and the kind of, you know, uh, the decade long history of it. Moderna got involved around 2010. That's when the company was founded. You know, it was spun off um, from a, a, a lab um, and, you know, they have made their own incremental contributions, of course. Right. And so what Moderna is saying in this new lawsuit to Pfizer is that, uh, you know, your vaccine, the Pfizer BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine actually infringes some of the patents we have uh, on both uh, on some of the key, both coronavirus technology and also the mRNA technology. And so, you, as you can imagine, you know, there are many, many dozens of patents on mRNA technology and Moderna is saying that uh, Pfizer BioNTech is infringing uh, on, on, on two parts of it. Okay, and so, uh, you know, still staying with the case. Uh, so what do you think, uh, what are the possible uh, outcomes or the um, different scenarios that we could be looking at here? And of course, you know, what would that mean for access to COVID-19 vaccines for people around the world? I, I think the most likely scenario here, um, and we should be clear, so Moderna is seeking damages, it is seeking royalties, but it's not seeking what's called an injunction, right? It's not trying to stop Pfizer-BioNTech from selling its vaccine. What it's doing is telling Pfizer-BioNTech, uh, you should be paying us a percentage, you know, uh, of, of your sales or some other calculation uh, because you are using our technology without our permission. And so the most likely outcome, um, I think, is, you know, the courts will kind of assess uh, you know, both the validity of patents, you know, there'll be kind of this, this process, you know, Pfizer BioNTech will file its complaint, maybe it'll challenge the patents. But I think the, the one of the most likely outcomes is the fact that uh, if there is kind of a finding of infringement, um, and if there is one, then 
Pfizer will have to pay Moderna a slice of you know the billions of dollars it has made. Um, and, you know, and then the key question will be, you know, how many you know millions of dollars will Pfizer have to pay, and we'll have to see how that ends up being calculated. So I think from an access perspective, we can say that um, you know there are it is primarily going to be uh, a monetary situation. Um, one of the potential concerning impacts here might be the fact that um, you know Pfizer, when it entered into contracts with a lot of developing countries, it actually told developing countries that if we get sued by anyone, you know we're not liable for the costs you are. Um, and so you know it remains to be seen if and you know if that applies and if, whether Pfizer will actually act in that way, but that could be, um, you know, a significant development as well. Okay, and just uh, to come back to something that you mentioned before, of course, so the technology that's uh, being disputed here uh, has been uh, developed and built upon, uh, you know, in, in, di in different uh, phases and by different people. And uh, part of that uh, has been also made possible thanks to uh, U.S. National Institutes of Health, uh, we, who work with public funding. Uh, so maybe... Uh, can we speak a bit about uh, of the validity of the dispute and uh, if uh, you know how can Moderna actually uh, take something that's being developed with public funding, go to court and claim ownership over that, and whether the U.S. government is taking any stand when that's concerned? Right. So there's there's many different components of mRNA technology, and Moderna, uh, at least in its press release, uh, you know deliberately states that this is not you know the patents that were at dispute uh, between the national institutes of health and moderna over the covid-19 vaccine however as we know there are still so many more kind of federal contributions to mrna science um, and so let me actually give you even a, a stronger example here so the story i told about those academics at the University of Pennsylvania who figured out, you know, if you modify RNA, you can, uh, you know, introduce it into the body and it's uh, tolerated well. What Moderna is claiming that Pfizer, Pfizer infringed is actually a, uh, a different kind of modification uh, and, and not even necessarily a different kind, but it's, it's a particular kind of modification that they are saying that Pfizer is infringing and that they have a patent on. But the idea and the invention of modifying was done at the University of Pennsylvania, right? And so you can see how incremental the step that Moderna says that it has taken really is. And so it makes you wonder, you know, if you go to the ocean and you have, you know, uh, a bottle of water and you, you know, put some ocean water into your bottle, uh, can you suddenly start saying, this is my water, right? This is my... Uh, this is mine and, you know, uh, you can't have it. And so it really goes to show, I think, the metaphor around, you know, knowledge as a resource, um, uh, and particularly when it is publicly funded and, and publicly uh, supported. And so uh, finally, one final question. Uh, so maybe uh, looking at it from a bit of a different perspective, um, do you know, what would you say would be the ideal scenario to see in this case? and um, maybe also reflecting a bit on how uh, mRNA uh, technology could actually be made more accessible to, uh, to more people instead of uh, pursuing this, this road that Moderna and uh, Pfizer and the other uh, pharmas, uh, big pharma companies have chosen. So right now we are seeing a strategy of control, right? Moderna is trying to exercise monopoly control Moderna is saying to Pfizer, if you want to continue selling this vaccine, if you want to continue using mRNA technology, you have to go through us. And it raises the question, why, <laughs> right? Why should we allow Moderna to monopolize this technology and control how it is developed, not only now, but also in the future for many different kinds of applications? Because this is not just about COVID-19, right? This is about mRNA technology and all the future potential applications it might have. Um, you know, one of the kind of classic arguments the industry says is, oh, no, we do need to protect IP. We do need these patents because of a return on investment, right? But Moderna has already made, you know, 
tens of billions of dollars. I've already lost count, right? I think it might be more than 30 billion if I'm, if I'm remembering accurately. And so clearly there's been enough reward, right? Um, I think, you know, an ideal version of how this might uh, proceed if, you know, if we were to understand mRNA technology would be that mRNA technology itself, the, the key patents would be shared, right? Um, they would be shared widely. Um, and, you know, there can be like royalties, right? Royalties is, is, are not necessarily the, the problem here, right? The problem is the way the company seeks to control the technology. And so you could imagine if the patents were widely shared, they're widely licensed, you know, for some reasonable royalty, then manufacturers around the world could use the technology and develop it in their own ways, right? And, and make it, you know, uh, more locally a, a, applicable. You know, they could, they could pursue disease targets um, you know, that are regional, they could, um, uh, you know, provide additional innovation and, and kind of think of new ways of improving the technology. But instead, what we have right now is this big company uh, basically asserting itself and saying that this is ours, right? This is ours. And what we need to do as a global community is push back and say, actually, you know, mRNA belongs to all of us. And I think that's actually uh, you know, one of the uh, key principles, I think, that the World Health Organization is supporting through the uh, mRNA technology transfer hub, uh, which is why it's so important. It's an effort by developing country manufacturers around the world uh, to work with mRNA technology uh, and to, to, to uh, help provide vaccines and, and, and treatments in the future. Uh, so we are not reliant on just a handful of companies uh, controlling uh, who gets access on, uh, and on what conditions. There's one way to look at this case, which is, you know, a purely commercial dispute between these two giants, you know, and who cares if Moderna, you know, gets Pfizer to pay Moderna money, right? There's that, that's one way of looking at it. I mean, you know, and many people are, are looking at that in that way. Um, but there's another way of looking at it, which is about who asserts control to technology and who sets the terms and conditions under which life-saving vaccine technology is available, right? Um, and so while we can't say for sure, you know, what the consequences of the case might be and what it might look like, um, I think it's reasonable to say that, you know, we can imagine that some more mRNA manufacturers uh, around the world will be a little bit more careful now. Might be, uh, you know, might be, there might be some chilling effects, uh, at least partially on, on some innovation uh, for mRNA technology. Uh, and they'll be watching closely. Um, and some might actually, you know, decide to leave the field entirely, potentially, uh, depending on uh, how the technology is controlled and exercised. Um, and so we'll, we'll just have to wait and see. Thank you very much, uh, Zane, and uh, thanks to everyone who tuned in to listen to People's Cells Dispatch this episode, and see you next time.